Hello, welcome to Story Circles. Here's a funny story about two laundry women. Each wants to be the one to keep the villagers' clothes clean and fresh, but they both use some very dirty tricks. It's written by famous Trinidadian writer Samuel Salvan and set in Trinidad during the time of World War II. It's called The Village Washer. Shortly after the last war, the laundry situation took a turn for the worse in the village of San Susi, a sugarcane hamlet 30 odd miles from the capital city of Port of Spain in Trinidad. Here, Ma Lambi ruled supreme as the only washer in the district, and in her sole supremacy, she grew careless after she had established herself. Malambi was old, but possessed remarkable strength, which seemed to bow her legs, so she walked like a duck. With the declaration of war, she began to be neglectful of collars and sleeves and the folds at the bottom of trousers, where the villagers always looked to judge her workmanship. If a button broke or came off as she scrubbed the clothing with a corn husk, she no longer bothered to mend it. And if a thin shirt ripped as she kneaded her gnarled hands into the cloth, she swore the tear was there before she got the shirt. Was a time when she used four bars of blue soap, and if the dirt and perspiration was still stubborn, bought a bit of washing soda and did her best to get the clothes looking clean again. Ma Lambi had four flat irons which she heated in a coal pot, wrapping a piece of cloth around the handle to protect her hand as she pressed the clothes. And a good job she did too, until the war started. Then she bought half the amount of coals and stop greasing the irons with lard when they were not in use. When she was ironing, she just slid the hot iron around quickly, folded the clothes, put them in the flat wooden tray, and took them around on her head every Saturday to deliver the laundry. However, Ma Lambie's excuse that there was a war going on didn't stop the villagers from complaining. There were about 40 of them living near the cane fields where they were cutting the canes to be transported to the sugar mills two miles away. Of these, about 10 did their own washing and the rest depended on Ma Lambi. But the old woman paid no attention to their complaints. She always promised to do better the following week. But when she came around balancing the tree on her head, Customers discovered all the dirt under the collars, and once a merino was so torn that the owner's wife asked her if it was a net to catch fish in the river and refused to pay for it. Malami was unperturbed. In fact, she was brazen enough, as a villager put it, to announce that she was raising laundry prices. As you know, she told the woman as she stopped at each hut to collect the dirty linen, we fighting a war and the prices of all things going up. So from now on, I will have to charge more to do up the clothes. Long time a shirt was 12 cents. Now it have to be 18 cents. And long time, skirt was 18 cents, now it have to be a shilling. From hut to hut, as Ma Lambi passed, words flew furiously. Neighbor, you hear about Ma Lambi, how she charging more to do up the clothes now? You can imagine that. And look how careless she getting, not even bothering to sew up a tear or put back on a button. Yes, it's true. 
I only wish we had another washer in the village. She's the only one. That's why she getting on so. Well, I for one going to try and do the washing myself if I have time in the evening. The woman must be mad or something. She said it war cause it. What was she talking about? A delegation of housewives visited Ma Lambie where she lived in a broken down hut under a mango tree. And there was a great argument which lasted for two hours. At the end of that time, the women retreated making threats and shaking their fists at Ma Lambie, who had told them flatly that they could do their own nasty washing if they didn't like her terms. She lost five customers the following week, but the others were forced to put up with her conditions. Ma Lambi smiled to herself as she went about her washing. But while she was having her own way, word of the villagers' plight reached another hamlet called Donkey City. And another aged woman named Ma Prokop migrated to San Susi with the hope of taking over the business from Ma Lambi. The day Ma Prokop arrived, she was greeted with shouts and smiles, though the people were cautious not to commit themselves too much, fearing she might turn out to be another Ma Lambi. But Ma Prokop was a clever woman. The first day, she put up a notice in the village shop, saying she was willing to take in laundry at pre-war prices. She said, she was an experienced washer from Donkey City and was out to give complete satisfaction to one and all. It was a long notice and the spelling was bad and it wasn't worded exactly that way. But the three people in the village who could read saw it and soon everybody knew. When Ma Lambie heard about it, she waddled over to the shop and stuck up a big piece of cardboard on which she had had the village painter write a few words in red paint, stating that she was negotiating with a firm in the city for a new type of washing machine which would make old clothes look like new. There was no electricity in the village, and it was a lie anyway, but for the first time in her life, Ma Lambie was afraid of losing her trade. That Saturday, as she made her wrongs, she didn't even get a vest to wash. Within a week, she'd lost all her customers. She was jeered at, and the new washing machine became a big joke. Even the children made fun of her, shouting out, wash up, wash up, when they saw her. If Ma Lambi saw Ma Prokop walking down the road, she waddled over to the other side and turned her head as if she was smelling something bad. She looked upon the intruder as a hated enemy and thought up means of recovering her trade and at the same time putting Ma Prokop to such shame that she would have to go back to Donkey City in a hurry. At first, she tried spreading lies. You know, she told the woman she met by the shop, that new washer is a nasty woman. She don't even rinse the clothes. And she looks so sickly. Take care she don't spread disease in the village. But Ma Prokop's actions soon had the whole village on her side. She worked late in the night, sewing on buttons and mending torn clothing. And she made it her business to be friendly and was especially kind to the children, buying sweets for them and telling them stories. Ma Lambie now started a malicious rumor that Ma Prokop was an obia woman who changed herself into a blood-sucking animal at night. The simple-minded villagers, quick to superstition and belief in omens and evil spirits, became uneasy as the rumour took root.
One night, a wounded animal ran into a backyard and left the trail of blood. Next morning, Ma Lambi told him, hmm, it looked like Ma Prokop was working overtime last night. I don't know how you people could let that Obia woman live here. They began to imagine things. Night noises were attributed to an evil spirit. And though no one pointed directly to Ma Prokop, there was an uneasy air whenever she was around. Quick to see her advantage, Ma Lambi pressed home the fact that the new washer was unusually fond of children and that little ones were the favourites of Obia women. She did more than talk. One night, she poured a gallon of poison onto the roots of a big silk cotton tree in the centre of the village and next day divined that as a result of Ma Prokop's evil deeds, the tree would die before a week passed. She began to make a study of black magic in order to set the village against Ma Prokop. She collected miscellaneous liquids and bones and other paraphernalia and cleared the hut of mirrors and all objects in the sign of the cross. Things came to a head when the silk cotton tree died. It just withered up as Ma Lambi had predicted and within two weeks it was nothing but a standing skeleton. The village woman got together to discuss the situation. It happened just as Ma Lambi say. It looked like Ma Prokop is really a Obia woman. We have to put she to the test. Get she to look in a mirror and make the sign of the cross over she head. If she is really a Obia woman, she can't stand that at all. Ma Prokop, meanwhile, was well aware of what was going on in the village. One morning, she went to Donkey City and came back with a parcel under her arm and a small smile on her lips. Two days later, on a hot, sunshiny morning, a group of housewives came into Ma Prokop's yard as she was hanging out the laundry. Ma Lambi was not among them, but while they were gathering, she had told them exactly what to do. Look in she house. I bet you wouldn't see any mirrors. And I bet you too that you find a lot of funny things in the house, like bone and bird feather and bottles, and you might even find a skeleton. For Ma Lambi had done what she thought would be the last damning thing. She had sneaked into Ma Prokop's hut and hidden all the stuff with which she had been practicing her own evil acts. And she had removed the only mirror in the room and a small crucifix near the head of the bed. Ma Prokop hung out a pair of khaki trousers and turned to face the woman. They got to the point right away. Ma Prokop, the leader said, we hear that is you who work in Obi in the village and causing evil spirit to walk about in the night. What nonsense you're talking? She put her hands on her hips and looked outraged. Well, anyway, are we going to search your house? They left her standing there and went into the hut. A minute later, Bottles and bones came hurtling out the window. It's true, it's true. The woman came tumbling from the hut in fear. You're really working, Obia. Look at all these things we find in your room. Ma Prokop recovered quickly from this unexpected development. All these things you see here, she waved her hands to the ground. They don't belong to me, I swear. She made the sign of the cross with her two forefingers and kissed it loudly. They belong to Ma Lambi, 
I sure is she who put them in there. Because she's so spiteful since I come to the village and take away all the washing. The women began murmuring among themselves. Then suddenly, one of them came forward and shoved a mirror in Ma Prokop's face. With a deliberate calm, the washer said, Thank you. And she fixed her hair looking straight into the mirror. Then, as if in a rage, she pulled the mirror and dashed it to the ground. That is the true test, one in the group whispered. If she really is a Obia woman, she can't look in a mirror. Ma Lami must be telling lie. It look as if Ma Prokop not guilty. Ma Prokop caught the turning of the tide. Listen, she said. Let all of us go over by Ma Lambi and give she the test with a mirror and a cross. I have just what we need. Hide away inside the house. Just give me a chance to get it. She dashed inside and came back with the parcel she had brought from Donkey City. She took the lead, heading straight for Ma Lambi's hut. You, Ma Lambi, she shouted as they got into the yard. You're fooling people and saying that it's I who work in Obia, when it's you all the time. Come out here in the yard, let me test you. Ma Lambi came charging out of the hut. What you mean by keeping so much noise in my yard, she demanded. She tried to keep a steady face, but she knew that something had gone wrong. Look, we have a mirror across here. Ma Prokop loosened the parcel and stepped ahead of the group. She moved quickly and turned the mirror full in Ma Lambi's face, at the same time lifting the cross above her head. No one heard the fierce words Ma Prokop was fiercely whispering or saw the weird glint in her eyes. But everyone saw Ma Lambi cower in fear. A look of extreme terror came into her face. She began to shake as if she had ague. Clasping her hands to her head, she turned and ran shrieking into the hut. Ma Prokop turned to the frightened villagers. Nothing more to worry about, she said in a tone of authority as she wrapped the mirror and cross into a parcel again. You will never have any obia here as long as I stay in the village. The next morning, Ma Prokop stood by her hut, watching Ma Lambi take the road to Donkey City, all her belongings wrapped in a sheet which she had slung over her shoulder. As the old woman looked back for a last glimpse of San Susi, she caught sight of Ma Prokop leaning on the fencing, watching her. With a yell of terror, she waddled after her long shadow cast by the morning sun. <laughs>